the United States federal government nutrition guidelines. Sounds like a very nebulous uh, bureaucratic thing that probably doesn't really affect any of us. I mean, we all eat what we want to eat anyway, right? Well, I have a very special guest today who is going to help you understand what the guidelines are and why they truly matter to people that you may love and people that you may cherish. Uh, people are suffering because of these federal government nutrition guidelines. And uh, there's a lot of funny business going on behind the scenes that I think you should know about. So uh, let, I'm, uh, I've got a, the, the great pleasure of having Nina Teicholz, who wrote the, the book, I hope that you've read, The Big Fat Surprise. If you haven't read it, there's a link down in the show notes. She's doing some amazing work. Uh, I'm kind of working from the bottom up, and she's working within the system, trying to change the system from the top down. And so if you, if you know someone who has a child in school or is a patient in a hospital or is an inmate in a prison, all of these people are forced to eat by the nutritional guidelines put out by, by our federal government. So that's millions and millions of Americans. And if you live in another country, then I want you to understand that most countries in the world follow the lead of the U.S. federal government nutrition guidelines. And so even if you don't live in America, people that you cherish and love can be affected by these federal guidelines. So without fear, the further ado, uh, I'm going to bring on Nina. If you know someone that might benefit from this, please share this video. I'm live on Facebook and YouTube right now. And both of these videos will be available after the live stream's over. You can share those to any other social media platform. You can share them around the world to help people understand that the nutrition guidelines put out by the USDA are actually very important for the overall health of our country and, in fact, of our world. So without further ado, let's see if Nina's with us here. There she is. Hey, Nina. Hi. It's hey, Ken. Great to see you and everybody, yeah, all your pleasure. friends exactly. out there. My Twitter buddy. <laughs> right. You're often tweeting the kind of things that I'm tweeting. So that's why I knew we'd have a good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And so I kind of consider myself a, a grassroots part of this movement. I'm, I'm, I'm working in the, with the people, among the people. And, and it's my philosophy that if enough of just the regular people transform their health by eating what I consider to be the proper human diet, then at some point the guidelines will just cease to matter. But I know you disagree with that because there are people who are kind of held captive by the nutritional guidelines. And we're going to talk about that. But first, I want you to hmm. tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and why we should care what you think. <laughs> well, um, uh, let's see. I can't pipe in my mom here to say, like, oh, listen to Nina. Well, I got involved in studying in um, nutrition as a journalist. I am a journalist and I had, I really got interested uh, about well, in the early 2000s. So now almost 20 years ago in the subject of really of dietary fat, um, this very narrow part of nutrition that um, because I was assigned to write an article on trans fats and I didn't know anything about fat or what trans fat was or anything, but I knew that that I had my whole growing up and pretty much everybody I know had all obsessed about dietary fat. You know, what kind of fat do you eat and what's good fat or what's bad fat? And so I spent almost a decade writing this book, The Big Fat Surprise. Um, and then really it's the main thesis of that book is that saturated fat is not bad for health. Saturated fat is why we originally avoided meat and eat, drink low fat dairy. And um, it's also in, coconut oil and butter. Um, so that's the main thesis of the book. And in investigating that, I came, I realized that what had replaced saturated fat, which, which were these polyunsaturated vegetable oils, um, I did a tremendous amount of research into how those were really toxic and um, caused cancer in trials. And so anyway, I became really obsessed with fats. I think um, a lot of people have maybe read some of my work. And then my book came out in 2014, and uh, then these dietary guidelines, well, the expert report for dietary guidelines came out in 2015, the next year. And I remember reading that expert report. You know, I had just spent like a decade reading every single study I could, you know, thousands and thousands of studies. And my book is also a history of how these guidelines had come about. But even in writing that, I didn't understand how important they were. So I read this expert report, and I realized 
I was like, well, where's all the science? Like, where's the science that I've studied? And I went and I looked at every single study, the entire library of science that is used to support our, our guidelines. I mean, every single study I analyzed and I pulled up and I looked at it and I, um, and I just, I couldn't find any rigorous evidence for our guidelines. I mean, so, let, let's, let's, let me break that down. So people, can can hear what you just said. You're saying that there is no meaningful research that supported the low fat, lots of whole grains, that there's really no meaningful research or science that supports that as a as a proper human diet that leads to optimal health. Yeah, I mean, it's stunning when you think about, you know, basically what do the guidelines say? And just to add another reason here of why they're so important. I'm sure pretty much every single one of your listeners and fans and followers try to follow uh, advice from their doctor and their nutritionist or their dietitian, and all those healthcare professionals are taught the guidelines. So this is what the guideline says. So we've all been there trying to be healthy on this diet. Eat more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low fat milk, and you know lean meat, not too much, and, um, and low fat dairy in general, and more you know nuts and seeds. That's the guidelines. Um, and so pretty much everybody is given that advice. They're, you know, if they aren't fed it in schools or fed it in the military or wherever they, they get their food or they, um, they learn it and they try to follow that advice as I did. I mean, I, um, you know, I made my own bread. I stopped eating red meat. I became pretty much near vegetarian for more than 20 years. And like many people, I wasn't getting any thinner. Um, I was getting fatter and not be not very healthy. So this is where I, so I, uh, and you have to understand that every single one of those statements, eat, you know, eat more fruits and vegetables. Well, I went and looked at all the reviews they had done on fruits and vegetables, and there's no rigorous evidence to show that eating fruits and vegetables promotes health. It's not to say that they don't promote health, but you can't find, when I, when I say rigorous evidence, I mean randomized controlled clinical trials that show that people eating more fruits and vegetables are healthier than people who don't. Whole grains large systematic reviews of all the literature on whole grains show they do nothing to promote health compared to other grains or, you know, refined grains even. Um, so, you know, you can go through the low fat dairy and the lean meat that comes out of the belief that saturated fats are bad for health. But if you've reviewed the literature on saturated fats, you know that that is um, also not true. I mean that that literature doesn't hold up and there's now more than a dozen systematic reviews of all of that data. Uh, so there's like there's really nothing <laughs> there's nothing in the guidelines that is based on good science, and that, um, that seems so foreign to just the average man or woman walking the street. They're like, no, I mean the federal government wouldn't waste our time just making up some random guidelines. And in fact, the guidelines aren't random. If you read into this much, you'll quickly see that the guidelines are very closely uh, controlled and corralled by the big food industry. And, and the big food industry can make a, lot, a, a huge percentage markup profit on things made out of processed grains, vegetable seed oils, and sugar. The, the, right. the, you can use that, that, that trio combination to make virtually any product under the sun. Right. And you make a huge markup profit on that. That's where these guidelines came from. The USDA is actually it works for the for the wheat growers and the and and the sugar the sugar cane sugar beet grow that's who they work for they don't really work for your optimal health and so I want everybody out there to understand that kind of just the politics of this the federal government didn't waste their time they actually uh, made good use of their time taking care of their clients which is big food not the actual consumer who's trying to live a healthier life am I am I close to right there. Yeah, I mean, you're making a very good point, and it's part of the politics that which are extremely complicated. So the guidelines are sort of an amalgam of different forces, and definitely one of those forces is that they are meant to benefit the food industry. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at everything in those all those middle aisles of the supermarket, it is you know the top ingredients are sugar, grains, and and industrial vegetable oil. I mean, those are, you know, that's cookies, crackers, chips, cereal, breakfast, everything. That's are all made of some formation of those, those ingredients and the guidelines promotes that. Um, and, and so, so it is, and, and the USDA has this conflicting mission and has from the start, it was recognized from the very 
from the earliest days of the guidelines when they were launched in 1980, that the USDA has a mission to promote the food industry. That's part of USDA's mission is to promote American foods while at the same time trying to tell Americans which foods to cut back on in order to preserve their health. So that is just a contradictory mission and always has been. Um, so the USDA, it's kind of a set up conflict of interest and designed to fail, but the guidelines are also, if you look at things like there are caps on saturated fat, the cap on cholesterol, um, long-standing caps on, you know, excessive caps on salt. I mean, these are just long time biases. A lot of this going back to many people know Ansel Keys and the American Heart Association, but they're just biases that go long, you know, go back decades and decades and they, um, and they really can't change. If they just drop their cap on cholesterol, the cap on dietary cholesterol, why we all, why we all avoided egg yolks and shellfish and, but, um, but even that, they can barely bring themselves to say, you know, it's a one line in a 492 page report and they don't really send, they don't think they ever sent out a press release or let anybody know. Um, so, and the caps and saturated fats, I think fit into that category of kind of just an old, a, a lot of bias and institutional rigidity around this recommendation. Um, so, and, but you're you're also fundamentally right that these guidelines are not really there to serve Americans. <laughs> I mean, their mission is to be for the general public. But here's one of the bizarre things I learned about the guidelines that I think ought to just shock everybody um, right off their chair, which is that they are only for healthy people. So yeah. they yeah. are. So you know, depending on your definition of how many people have a metabolic disease in America, the conservative estimate is by the CDC, which is a government agency, is that 60% of Americans. There was a recent analysis by the University of North Carolina of um, government data saying that that number is closer to 88% of Americans who are yeah. have some form of metabolic disease and they're taking some kind of medication for which they're taking some kind of medication. They have yeah. some early signs. So that would be 12% of Americans who are metabolically healthy. And those are the people for whom the guidelines are intended. And what yeah. I mean that they're only for healthy Americans, they are not even, I mean, they're not consistent about this. There's so much about the guidelines that are contradictory, but they do not review the literature on people diagnosed with obesity, diabetes, heart disease. So they don't look at those studies. Although yeah. they say, if you follow the guidelines, you'll get healthy, but right. they don't look at the literature, the scientific literature on how to lose weight. They have excluded all of that literature from their reviews. This just this year they did that. And I think they've done it in previous years, although I haven't gone back to check, but imagine that. Imagine the guidelines that have, are only for 12% of America. And yet, as we know, they're served in schools and they're served in to the military and in prisons and to poor people and to women and infants and children and feeding programs for the elderly. Um, they are served to sick and well alike as if this one size fits all diet was going to serve yeah. everyone. So let's go into a little more detail about that, Nina, because I think that's, you know, everybody thinks, well, I can, I go to the grocery, I buy what I want to buy, but there are so many Americans that don't have that option. And so who are, what's a good comprehensive list of people who are basically uh, imprisoned by the guidelines starting out right. with, when you send. And so for, and let me tell, I'm going to tell a story that actually happened to my family. Uh, but who, who starting with preschoolers and everyone you can think of who literally yeah. has to eat by these guidelines, if they're going to get federal money for food. So, the school lunch program, and then all the kids who also get breakfast at school. So, you know, uh, the women and infant children, so young um, pregnant women, and they, and, and they're, when they have their infant children, are, are you get, they're given a, a basket of food based on the guidelines, feeding programs for the elderly, uh, so people who are poor and elderly and get meals delivered to their homes. Um, they, none of those programs, um, I think I think none of them contain any red meat in them. I know that the the women and infant children do. I think they get one egg a week, and they get like six wow. boxes of Kellogg's. I've I've seen a Wick basket. It's called a Wick basket. I mean, it's like six boxes of Kellogg's cereal and all this fruit juice and and you know maybe an egg or two and no meat. Um, so 
So feeding pro elderly people, I mean, really, it's the most disadvantaged people in our society and who also tragically tend to have higher rates of diet related diseases so are even more in need of a diet that will help them not hurt them. So let's continue the list. The list goes on, you know, um, an Indian reservations, they get boxes of food, they have something like 40% rate of diabetes in their children among their children population. Um, and they get largely, you know, the guidelines are mostly grains, the majority of the food is grains. Um, so we talked about hospitals, um, prisons, uh, the military is not forced to eat things, but in their educational programs, they're told like, you know, there's the red light over the meat and the green light over the pasta. This will give you energy. This will not. Um, military rations driven um, in large part by the guidelines. So um, who else? I mean, in many large medical practices, and you probably know this, Ken, but um the doctors are told that they have to recommend the guidelines because that is the gold standard. And if they do anything else, else then they risk uh, medical malpractice if they're not teaching the gold standard. Um, and I know that also for nutritionists and dietitians, there's, there are similar kinds of issues within their kind of guilds. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so all, all dietitians and nutritionists are, are taught at schools uh, of nutrition and dietetics. And all of those schools receive federal dollars. And so the, that's the key. If, if an institution receives any federal money, then they have to feed whoever the participants of that program are by the nutritional guidelines issued by the USDA. And so if, you, if you're a parent or a grandparent and, or you know anyone who, are, who, who has a child who's stuck in those conditions, please share this video with that parent or with that step parent because Many people think, well, no, I mean, it's a school lunch. Of course, they're going to give them nutritious food. Of course. No, they're going to give them food that big food makes the biggest markup on. That's what they're going to get. They're going to get a, 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 a diet that's so low in saturated fat that it doesn't feed their brain for growth and development and function. They're going to get a diet so devoid of any kind of meaningful animal nutrition that they're going to be deficient in several vitamins and minerals. And, and, it, and Nina's exactly right. It's the poorest among us who are fed this crap. And so if, you're, if your kids go to a private school and, and, and that private school doesn't accept federal dollars, then no, they don't, they don't have to eat this crap. They get to eat whatever. And so let me tell you what happened to, to, to me personally, Nina. Uh, my kids are going to a small public school in a, in a very poor county. And it was a very small little uh, elementary school. And there were four elementary schools in the county. And so the, the, the cafeteria ladies, there, was, there were uh, ladies there that were older and they kind of ran the cafeteria. And they said, you know, this stuff's crap. I'm not going to feed this to these kids. <laughs> so they started cooking meals. They would cook bacon and eggs for breakfast. They would cook them a nutritious meat and two or something for lunch. And somebody reported them. Wow. And they got a very stern letter from the federal government that said, if you don't want to lose all of your federal funding, this is a true story. Yeah, if you'd like to not lose all of your federal funding, then you need to immediately stop cooking food for these children. And you need to feed them the food that we send you. That's it. And so this little elementary school in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee in the woods almost lost their federal government uh, federal government funding because these two ladies were trying to feed these children whom they loved. I mean, it was such a small community that they felt like these were their kids too, and they just felt terrible feeding this food. And, and so they had to stop doing that or the school would have lost all their federal dollars. So if you guys think that the federal government won't enforce this, I've actually seen it happen. That is quite a story. And, and, and you know, it does – remind me that uh, it is, you're absolutely right that these, so these um, contracts, the, you know, the reason, the, it, is, it is absolutely true that one of the reasons the guidelines cannot change according to the science is that the contracts that these companies get to send, to, imagine making food that's going to be sent to every school in the nation. Uh, and who do you think has these contracts? It's huge companies like PepsiCo. I mean, I looked at their school nutrition website, the things that they send out to schools. Well, not only can they send Mountain Dew, because you can, you're allowed 10% of your calories is sugar in the guidelines, 
Uh, but they also send out, you know, packs of Doritos, pizza Doritos, and you know, whatever PepsiCo sells, because that's, uh, you know, you're allowed, you're allowed lots of grains in the guidelines, and then you're required that all your fats become from um, industrial polyunsaturated vegetable oils. So there's 27 grams of soybean oil required in the guidelines every day. So these are huge companies getting these contracts to feed all these people and they don't want to give them up. Imagine if we handed back control of our school lunches to, to people locally. I yeah. mean, it really, it really is, it really is scandalous. <clears throat> and you can't get, you know, you, you can't yeah, get local gross. food. Yeah. So uh, that's how powerful they are, you know, and, 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 um, when I realized this, so it took me a long time to realize how powerful the guidelines were and how much they touched each and every one of us. I mean, not to even just mention things like every doctor you go to is schooled in the guidelines. So if you're somebody who's following a different kind of health regime, as many of your followers do, they can't find anybody who's receptive to anything about what they're doing. And they certainly weren't taught by their doctor unless they were lucky enough to have used their doctor. I mean, so the whole medical system works against any all, any kind of guidelines that's not uh, sorry any kind of nutrition recommendations that's not the guidelines. Absolutely, and so every so often the federal guidelines they come up for reconsideration, and uh, this year has been very interesting to watch. Give us yeah. some, give us some more information about that from behind the scenes. How often do they come up for reconsideration? Maybe we need to adjust and and then uh, what's been yeah. going on this year, because this is the year 2020 when they get reexamined and perhaps changed, perhaps not. Right. They get they get um, updated every five years, according to the, the law. And they um, and I had thought in 2015, well, you know, we definitely can get something done by 2020. And here we are in 2020, and I have watched this whole process and documented every step of the way. And we, my group is called the Nutrition Coalition, and you can get yourself down to weeds as far as you wanna go on, you know, what is going on with the guidelines. But it has just been astonishing to watch this process unfold. Um, the, it, you know, it starts with the appointment of an expert committee, which is, um, a group of academics from around the country. And we tried to get some people appointed, like some people will know the good Dr. Sarah Hallberg, who's an expert in low carb. Um, and we tried to get um, John Iwanides, who's a superb, uh, he understands scientific methodology, how to evaluate science. And we tried to get a couple of other people on. Anyway, we were not successful, um, despite um, a lot of effort. They said they lost John Ewanese's application. Um, and uh, and then that committee reviews the science. And it's really, um, and there are five public meetings. And they have, you know, there's a whole public comment process that goes on. There's two opportunities for public comments to be made in person. And you realize that the, the whole public comment process is, I mean, you can go through it and it's sort of exhilarating to stand and make a public comment to the committee, but you know, my, or to submit a public comment, but, um, but you come to understand that it seems to make absolutely zero difference to them whatsoever. It's right. certainly not an opportunity for learning. I and mean, we were able to get 3000 comments on at least on that we could just count on saturated fats, the need to look at the new evidence on saturated fats. There's been all this new evidence and, and we, you know, when that, I mean, we couldn't get anywhere is, is, is really, it's, it made yeah. me feel a little cynical about that process. Yeah. And I was praying for you the entire time, Nina, but I, but I had a sneaky suspicion that that would be the result. And here's why the people that run the federal guidelines nutrition program, they're not idiots. You guys, they're not, they're not stupid. They're very intelligent people. I mean, probably the, the least degree they've got is a bachelor's, if not higher. And so they're not stupid enough to, to think that they truly, honestly believe in their heart of hearts that ketchup is a vegetable. Yet it's listed as such. So wonder why. Are they stupid? No, they're not stupid. They're very intelligent. So why do they think that ketchup's a vegetable? Why do they think that French fries is a vegetable? Oh, that's, oh if you have fries and ketchup, that's two servings of vegetables right there. Boom. Right? Yeah. It, no, they know that that's not a vegetable, but their friends 
at Heinz and their friends at Orida want to make millions of dollars a year. And they also pay lobbyists to uh, take certain key people to lunch. And they also uh, make huge contributions to U.S. representatives campaign uh, coffers <clears throat> and U.S. senators campaign coffers. So they get to call ketchup and fries two servings of vegetables, not because they're stupid, but because they know which side the margarine is on of the of <laughs> those, right? And that's, why they're, right. that's why they're doing that. They don't care about you. They don't care that over half the country's obese. They don't care that over 88% uh, of the country has at least one marker uh, out of the five. And if you've watched my video about metabolic syndrome, you know all five. But 88% of humans in the United States have at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. But yet they're telling you ketchup's a vegetable. That's, that's the level of egregiousness we're talking about here. These people aren't dumb. They know ketchup is not a damn vegetable. Yeah. yeah. So they're not. So these are people who are um, the people on the committee are people who are not going to stick their heads up. That is very clear to me. The way the committee is put together is by, you know, they put together some very senior people who drive the committee and they are, um, by our analysis, they appear to be people who with who very close to government, long-term government contracts, millions of dollars, but they've they've gotten and worked at the, you know, the at NIH, if not USDA, and also, I mean, they're they're kind of creatures of government, and they are not going to do anything to change the status quo. Yeah, um, so if I was going to stack a committee, Nina, and everybody watching. If I was going to stack a committee. That's kind of how I would stack it. If I was trying to get a certain outcome, right? you would you would get the people who are all, they they go they work at USDA centers that are you know the USDA has various funds various centers around the country. These people, some of them, they work at those centers or they get large grants from them. So there's these creatures of government are sort of one component, and then there are almost everybody in the committee gets a massive amount of money from the food industry or, or uh, you know, there was a recent study that was done that came out showing that more than half of the committee has some kind of tie to um, a group called ILSI, which maybe many of you have heard of, but that's basically a, it's a nonprofit, but it's kind of, it's a nonprofit whose members include, um, whose in members include, you know, Cargill, McDonald's, Pepsi, Mars, Kellogg's. I mean, it's a, it's a nonprofit promoting the interests of the food industry. And most of the members of the Dietary Guideline Committee have some kind of service to that organization or been involved in, in some way. So um, you've been working on this for a few years, Nina, and you knew that 2020 was coming up and you knew the guidelines were going to be up, up for reconsideration. And so you've been working through your your uh, concern, the Nutrition Coalition, trying to work at the top and say, okay, guys, we know this is coming. We got a heads up. Let's get busy. Let's start talking to congressmen and senators, and let's let's get as many public speakers in front of this committee as possible. And tell us about the research because there's quite a bit of low carb research now that shows that it, it's a very healthy diet. What happened to that research? Was it looked at by the committee? Did the committee seem to take the public comments to heart and act on that at all? How did it go this year with the committee as they traveled around the country listening to just common people and then also looking at all the research? Um, so if you want to talk specifically about low carb diets for a moment, there were the, the public, there were maybe 20 low carb doctors who show up and showed up and, and made comments about the low carb public comments to the committee about the low carb diet. Uh, there, this was the first time that the committee was formally reviewing low carb diets. Um, in 2015, they reviewed low carb diets, but they didn't tell anybody. They never published the review. They, uh, they, they, they literally, they buried it in the methodology section. I wrote about this for uh, an op-ed that I just did two weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, if anybody is interested in that. But we have obtained this information showing um, that an, e an email chain obtained by the Freedom of Information Act showing that they had done this review of low-carb diets, but they, they decided to put it in the methodology section of the report 
where it didn't belong. And one of the members, a Harvard professor, piped up and said, you know, it doesn't belong there. It's a large body of research. We really ought to include it in the section where the other diets are uh, and make it a recommendation. And and that suggestion was just ignored. Um, so, so last time around, they just uh, stuffed low carb diets and pretended they didn't exist, even though at the time, I mean, I made a list of all the number of low carb studies there were. There were there were like 74 studies on low carb, including several two year long trials already. So, I mean, a really a large body of evidence. Now there's five years later, there's even more. But here's what the committee said when they came out with their um, conclusions about low carb. They said, um, they said regarding um, any studies where the carbohydrates are 26% of calories or less, what many of us would now is sort of considered a, the definition of a low carb diet, um, the proper definition. They couldn't find any studies. <laughs> they couldn't, they, they, they said, we, we went through the whole list of studies, like half of them they just ignored and the other half they excluded. And it seems that they excluded them either because they were excluding all the studies on weight loss per their decision not to address obesity, because that's certainly not a problem. Um, and, or they it developed this particular exclusion criteria that was exactly the definition of a low carb diet. In other words, they decided to exclude any trial where it only talks about macronutrients and doesn't talk about the actual foods that you eat. And as people who are familiar with the literature knows, the science knows that when you do a low carb study, you don't list out all the foods that everybody's going to eat. That's what they do in other kinds of diet trials. But for low carb, often they'll just say, you know, we have a target goal of a percentage of a percentage of carbohydrates, um, calories as carbohydrates, or a number of grams. So they decided any trial that was had that kind of protocol was going to be excluded. So they just excluded all the literature. They literally excluded all the low-carb literature. And there's actually a group now called Low Carb Action Network, um, the head of which is Mark um, Kukazella. I'm sure many of you know him. He's a doctor who's written a book on running, and um, he... And there are a number of other people there that I'm sure aren't working on that that you've heard of. But they are specifically advocating for a low carb, uh, a low carb diet to be in the guidelines. And I don't know where that's going to end up. I mean, right now there's been a member of Congress, Dusty Johnson, who's on the Agriculture Committee, who's written a letter to USDA saying this is not acceptable. There are numerous groups, not just us, calling for a delay in the guidelines and talking about these problems of this massive exclusion of evidence, the, and, and I mean, I could go through a list of things like, for instance, in some of their scientific reviews, they, um, they have, they finished them before the panel even came together as a panel. So they, the, the evidence only goes up through like 2016. And at one of the meetings, one of the committee members seriously asked the question of the audience, listen, if anybody knows of any evidence past 2016, we'd really love to have it. Because, wow. <laughs> because we, our systematic review only goes up through 2016. Wow. So yeah, may, maybe someone has sort of just said, you know, you should go to pubmed.gov. All <laughs> the research is there. It's all listed. And I thought everybody on the committee should already know that. So it's really, they're unbelievable shenanigans. And I want to say the most important one that we have really focused, even though it seems boring, I just need to tell your audience this issue and why it's so important, which is that they don't use any recognized methodology for reviewing the science. Um, and this is for anybody who cares about science, you have to, you know, and, and you, you know, your listeners out there will, I'm sure, understand things like, it's important to value, say, human trials over animal trials, or it's important to value a randomized controlled clinical trial, which is considered the gold standard, to start value with that as a higher valuation than studies that only show association, which are called epidemiological studies. But that the USDA doesn't have a methodology that does that. It doesn't explain how it grades its evidence. It doesn't tell you how it does it. It just lists all the studies it doesn't tell you how it evaluated them or what were the grades given or how it decided to rank things. And then it just comes up with a conclusion statement. Yeah. And that's because that's they, want to, they want to consider ketchup a vegetable. And if they were to actually use <laughs> mean science and then rank the science, 
by strength of evidence, then they would probably have to stop saying ketchup is a vegetable. Well, I mean, it's just one of the first principles of science is that it be reproducible. And if your methodology is basically a black box, you're saying, in go the studies, out comes the recommendation, and we can't tell you how we did it. That is not reproducible. Right. And that's how you get, you know, what comes out of it. This time they said, we should continue this caps on saturated fats. And not only that, in their discussion section, you'll enjoy this. They said, Somebody said, well, you know, we know that saturated fats is not an essential nutrient, so why don't we just why don't we just push the cap down to zero? How about wow. zero saturated fats? Wow. Yeah, because fat's not good for your brain or your nerves. Oh, and it's not in any yeah. foods that might be good for you. Yeah. You know, wow. you don't need and by the way, they they themselves said that by their own report that the the guy their current guidelines are deficient. We were talking about vitamins earlier. They are currently deficient in potassium, vitamin D, vitamin E, and choline and borderline for iron. Well, where do you get, you know, what's the best source of iron? Is a food that has contained saturated fats in it. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I, I think in large part it, it's definitely there's a crusade against meat at the upper levels of government. And I have a lot of my a lot of my listeners reach out and say that they literally think that uh, though some in federal government are trying to dumb down the U.S. population by making them have deficiencies in fatty acids they need for their brain and for and for cognition and for reflexes that you know if you get enough if enough people in the U.S. with fatty acid deficiencies with vitamin and mineral deficiencies they're going to be weak they're going to be uh, kind of sluggish thinking. They're not really going to be able to speak up against any atrocity. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I mean, at some point, Nina, <laughs> when you're stacking committees like this and when you're hiding the science and using the black box analogy, we put it all into this black box, which you can't see how it works. And then here's our guidelines. When you're doing stuff like that, I, it, I'm finding it harder and harder to argue with the conspiracy theorists. And maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe they are trying to make us dumb and weak. I don't know. All I know is that that I, I, I applaud your work trying to work at the top. I don't envy you at all because I, <laughs> I, I fear that what was coming up in 2020 is exactly what I think we're going to see transpire is that they're going to continue to say that ketchup's a vegetable and French fries are a vegetable and they're very nutritious and good for you. And they're going to continue to make Heinz and Orida and all the other big food manufacturers very, very happy with their guidelines. And they're going to continue to make the U S public and especially the children who are very susceptible who have to eat these guidelines. They're going to continue to make them sicker and sicker, more obese, more diabetic and have more fatty liver. I think that's, and that's why I've, I have focused all of my efforts is talking to the people, people, just regular people. You need to pack a lunch for your child. And if you need a doctor's note to do that, all you have to do is go see your doctor and say, hey, I need you to write me a note because I want my child to actually eat real food. And if that doctor won't do it, then fire their ass and go find another doctor who will write you that note saying, my child needs a, a, a packed lunch because I want my child to have a brain healthy, heart healthy diet. And that includes saturated fat and vitamins and minerals and amino acids. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you know that in New York City, you cannot send whole milk to preschool with your child, even if you pack it yourself, it's not allowed on the premises to send your preschool child. So it is, it's now considered a toxic substance that is banned from preschool. It's and new banned. Books. Yeah. Because because I don't, because it's not according to the the guidelines. Yeah. You know, you what else is you keep saying? You know, ketchup is a vegetable. Here's another good example for you: donuts, donuts on the menu for breakfast. That's part of the guidelines. The ten percent sugar, the refined grains. That's all part yeah, of the guidelines. For whole wheat donuts, Nina. That's why they're so healthy. No, no, no. You. Here's another secret about the guidelines that even though they say they put an emphasis on whole grains. If you look at the formularies, which is the which are the you know the the, for, the 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 amount of this and that of other other foods that are sent off to the schools, it is an equal amount of refined grains as whole grains. Sure. So kids kids get an grains. equal amount of refined grains. Why? Because this is really interesting. But only refined grains are enriched and fortified. That means they have those, um, you know, the B vitamins and um, iron and folate, I think. And so they need those nutrients because otherwise 
the dietary guidelines would be even more nutritionally deficient. Yeah. And so they Most need to the, get you those refined grains in order to make up the nutritional deficiencies, which you would normally get. Those nutrients are you would normally eat in animal foods, but they yeah. won't feed you animal foods. And so they have to put it in refined grains, which, by the way, those supplements are not as well absorbed by that, many people. I, I, yeah, that's the point I was just about to make, Nina, is all of the vitamins and minerals that, that processed grains are fortified with. Doesn't that sound like a wholesome word? Most of these vitamins and minerals are, are chemically produced and they are in a chemical structure of which the human body can't really absorb or assimilate or actually make bioavailable. And so they're just Peter pooped away. And so the child's really not even benefiting from the amount of vitamin D or, or riboflavin or any of this stuff. We're only getting it just, just enough of it to keep us from being clinically deficient. And I mean, it's my theory that that's why so many children have learning difficulties. So many children have no energy. They basically taken PE out of school now because none of the kids want to run and play because, you know, that's weird for a child to want to run around and play. Uh, it, it, it just almost defies belief. So now that we've got everyone good and pissed off, I hope we have, <laughs> if you ain't pissed off after hearing this, I don't know where your trigger is. What can people do? Right. Well, I, from the top to the bottom, what can we do? Yeah. To change it, Nina? Because obviously this has to be changed. Well, I want to say for everybody, you know, the important thing is to take care of your own health and your family's health. And that's a big job for many people. And you just listen to Dr. Ken Berry and do what he says. But then think about the people in the community around you and our nation as a whole. And that is why it is worth taking some of your time to do something and be heard. And here's what I recommend. So we are not out of luck yet. The, this week, there the committee is presenting its you know expert report, its draft expert report, um, and but we have until the end of the year to make as much noise as possible and let everybody should let their voice be heard. And if you go to the Nutrition Coalition, there's a little button that says "Take Action." It asks you to call or write or text or tweet your member of Congress. And it gives you the text uh, and it tells you, you know, here's some issues that we, we think are important. You can mention the ones you think are important, but it's really important. And the reason that we're asking people to go to Congress is we asked everybody to go to USDA and make public comments and do it the right way and play by the rules. And we really didn't get anywhere. And now we think that if we can reach members of Congress, because one of my experience in talking to members of Congress or their staff more likely is just that they don't hear these problems. They really don't hear from people. They hear a lot from, uh, you know, a very, very well organized, long standing, well organized groups that are promoting the vegan and vegetarian diet. They've been at this for decades, but they really have not heard from this community. Um, and it's because this community is pretty new. It's it's you know it's kind of come up and surged in the last decade. It's 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 mainly full of people sort of discovering for themselves, but it's not organized politically. It's not you know we don't have networks. We don't really we aren't organized, and um, and so that's fine. But it means that now people have to make their voices heard and Absolutely. and and contact your Congress person or people whoever they are, and let them know how much you care about this issue and how important it is. Absolutely. And I think that Absolutely. this kind of pressure, hearing these voices and this kind of pressure will, I, I really believe it will make a difference. Because one of the things that I have also found is that in just the same way that we've seen the low carb world grow up, you know, the real food world, um, it has touched people in, in, in on Capitol Hill, but they, but so you, you often have this experience of talking to somebody and they'll say, well, you know, my mom, uh, you know, re recovered from her diabetes. And, you know, there's more and more familiarity and people understand what we're talking about now. It's not a completely foreign subject, which it was when I started doing this work. Um, even a few years ago, people would just look at me blankly like, what are you talking about? Yep, yep, so exactly. and now, that guys, is not the case. If you're watching this, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, I've got the links to Nina's book, to the Nutrition Coalition. That's the website she was talking about. And then yes. also to her personal website. 
So go to the link for Nutrition Coalition, click the link, and then what's where's the button located and what, what's the button called where they can actually help? Yes, yeah, so you can either scroll down the, the, the home page to the, to the slab at the bottom or in the upper right hand corner, there's a red button that says take action. And you just press on that and it's pretty easy. It should take, you know, five minutes of your time. And let me mention one other thing. There's also um, a letter if you're um, an MD or a PhD or another credentialed healthcare practitioner, you can also sign that letter and that um, if this is not too information, it's just the leading uh, blog post. So the first blog post on the website is about that. Um, has buttons to all letter. of those. I've already signed the letter and I encourage any healthcare provider out there. If you're a, you have to be a graduate level healthcare provider or PhD researcher, you can go and sign that letter. Do that as soon as this video is over, right after you've shared this video with someone who has no idea that uh, ketchup's not really a vegetable, share it with them. But then go to Nina's uh, the Nutrition Coalition and sign up and sign that letter if you're an MD, DO, or PhD level healthcare provider. Because the more, I mean, the more initials uh, that congressmen and senators look at that. I tell people all the time, if they're the first person to ever tell their doctor about a low carb diet, their doctor is going to just think they're a kook, right? And that same law, that's a law of human nature. When you just hear one voice in the wilderness, you're like, that was weird. Same goes for congressmen and senators. When, when, if one constituent calls them up and says, hey, you need to go after a low carb diet, they're going to be like, okay, I don't know what that was all about. But when they hear it from 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 5,000 people, that's when senators and congressmen and doctors start to go, what is this low carb thing? I need to Google that. I mean, is that actually, is there any research backing that up? I'm, when I get home tonight, I'm going to look it up on the internet. And then all of a sudden they've heard the bell ring folks. And when they hear the bell ring, they can't unhear that bell. Or like Nina said, their mom has reversed their type two diabetes or this senator's dad has reversed his fatty liver by eating a low carb diet. When enough of those people come out of the woodwork and make their voices heard, that's when Nina's work is actually going to start to get some traction within the gears of government. Because right now, we're not a big enough voice. We're not a unified voice. We're not an organized voice. I absolutely want you to fix your health by eating a low-carb keto or carnivore diet. I absolutely want you to, to have an impact on your child's health or a gentle, loving impact on your grandchild's health. Don't make the parents mad. That doesn't help. But there, these are all things you can be doing to make the world a better place. But ultimately, if we're going to help the children who have to eat school lunches and, and preschool breakfasts and the patients in hospitals, the hospitals get federal government money. Oh, they got to follow the guidelines. The only way we're ever going to help those people. What about all the nursing home patients? Those nursing homes get federal dollars, right, Nina? They got to follow the guidelines. Right, right. Only can we help those people, can we help the children of New York State who are now considered terrorists, I guess, if they bring whole milk, whole milk to school? That's got to stop. And the only way it's going to stop is for enough, enough of us to stand up and speak up formally, not just out in the backyard. You've got to talk to your senator and your congressman. You've got to go to Nina's website, the Nutrition Coalition. And you've got to sign up and you've got to get the emails and you've got to say, hey, guys, enough is enough. Ketchup is not a damn vegetable. <laughs> Sounds good coming from you. I like that. We'll put that in our little speech. So it's nutritioncoalition.us. And and our, you know, we are arguing for rigorous science in the guidelines. And so our approach is you cannot, you know, there cannot be exclusion of evidence. We are not formally advocating for a low carb diet. And there's the group to go to that is also out there asking people to call their congressmen and senators. And you can also go to their website. It's called Low Carb Action. So remember, nutritioncoalition.us or lowcarbaction.org. And they, they are specifically advocating for a low carb diet. But I will tell you that most senators and congressmen feel uncomfortable advocating for a specific diet they'll just say you know it's out of my league the science they but they're 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 very responsive to the process issues the issue of science being excluded of science ending in 2016 of you know there being like the all the problems like of not having a methodology like those are issues that congress can respond to they can just say this process is not scientific 
So go back and do it over again. And Somebody don't exclude. That should, be the, that should be the title of either my next book or your next book is Ketchup is Not a Damn Vegetable. <laughs> I see that comment. That's good. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, Nina, let's wrap this up. Any All final right. thoughts, any final advice for people who are trying to, to help you change the system? What 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 What's the next step? Oh, you know, I think we've just talked about everything that people can do, and I urge you to do it. And just, uh, it, it really, people's voices matter. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it really is true that everybody's voice makes a difference. So I, I encourage everybody to, um, to before you go and make yourself that steak for dinner, to go and, and, and take action. And I also want to thank you, Ken, for having me on the show. You're delightful to talk to. And I know you're out there on Twitter always pushing these issues. So I want to thank you for that. Absolutely. I think <laughs> as soon as I get off, my next tweet's going to be ketchup is not a damn vegetable. Right? <laughs> okay, we'll put it on our website. Good, got it. We'll do. Okay. We'll do. Thank you so much, Nina Tajolts. If you guys want to check out Nina's book, the link's in the show notes. The nutritioncoalition.us is the website, and there's a link down there. You can type it in. Go and sign up. Get get signed up for their emails. Figure out what you can do to help change this, because I definitely want to want you to help me change it from the bottom up. But we also need people fighting from the top down. Uh, I pray for you every day, Nina. Thank you. I, I've said this so many times. I, I have hope and I pray and I and I, but I just don't know how you're ever going to make any because there's just billions of dollars in camp. Yeah, but people are strong. We are strong. People are. The truth is strong. Yes, the, the truth arc, is strong. the arc right. of justice bends towards truth. Yes, you have to I believe love that. that. I love that. You guys check out <laughs> Nina's book. Get that book if you haven't already read it. If you've already read it, buy it for a friend who needs to read that because there is nutrition science out there since 19 or 2016. There's lots about yeah. the low-carb diet and about keto. And, and I'm going to add a link to the lowcarbaction.org website in the show notes as soon as we get done because I think yeah. that they're doing important work too. Thank you so much, Nina. For Thank spending you. This time Thank with you me. for having me. It's great uh, talking to you. Always a pleasure talking to my my Twitter friend. So I'll talk to you next time, Nina. All right, guys, there you have it. So please do something today to help this cause. Either talk to your neighbor, talk to your state senator, your state rep, talk to your send an email to your congressman, your senator. Sign up at the nutritioncoalition.us. If you're a PhD, MD, or DO, sign their professional letter that's going to be given to the USDA. Is it going to change things overnight? No, it's not. Is it going to start to make a difference that ultimately will make a difference? Yes, it is. So uh, thanks to Nina so much. You're welcome to share this video if you think it'll help somebody else live a healthier life. And uh, you're also welcome to share it with uh, cafeteria managers, nutritionists, dietitians, and anyone else you think this video might help. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Dr. Barry. I'll see you next time.